this is an import bench mill or you know what's commonly referred to as a mini mill this is a bridge port as you can see it's a slightly different form factor now I'm going to go ahead and walk out on a little bit of a limb here and wager that for most hobbyists considering their first milling machine, one of the first major questions that you're probably going to be looking to answer is whether or not one of these mini mills or import bench mills, are they any good? Or I guess more accurately, are they good enough for you and whatever you plan to do with it? Or do you need to have that difficult conversation with your significant other about how you need to take up half of the garage for a 2,700 pound bridge port? Now, an internet search on the subject is likely to yield a whole range of opinions from to no, they're absolutely awful and you might as well just set your money on fire. So, all in all, maybe not super helpful when you're trying to make a major purchasing decision. Which is why I figured the only reasonable thing for me to do was to make a video about it. And add yet one more uninformed opinion to the already flaming hot dumpster fire of online advice. Okay. So my goal with this video is not to start handing advice out on the internet. Instead, I'll try and provide the information that I would have liked to have had when I was first looking at these machines. You know, if you're anything like me, you'll find when first getting into a hobby like this that it can be incredibly difficult simply because you don't know what questions to ask. What's important and what doesn't matter? What makes one machine good and another machine bad? These are the questions that we're gonna answer in this video. And to answer these questions, we'll cover a few broad categories and then focus on the important things to consider from each one of those categories when looking at a machine. For this, we will go over brand and country of origin, machine capacity or work envelope, Number three is rigidity slash weight slash form factor. Number four is power and torque. And then the fifth and final category is features. This is just the general features that you can expect to find on one of these machines. All right, so when it comes to brand and country of origin, in my opinion at least, there's really only a couple of major things to consider. First, let's talk about country of origin or where the machines are made. Because most manufacturers are gonna offer two different categories or tiers of machine. You're gonna have machines from China and machines from Taiwan. In general, the machines made in Taiwan are considered to be of a higher quality than the machines made in China. For example, Grizzly now owns the South Bend name and they sell some tools and machines branded as South Bend. Most of that stuff comes from Taiwan and most of it carries a much higher price tag than their GO whatever line of machines and tools. This isn't, however, a hard and fast rule. It definitely does not mean that you can't get a quality Chinese made machine. And it also doesn't mean that every machine made in Taiwan is amazing. I think the even more important thing to consider, especially when looking at Chinese made machines, is the brand of the machine. So then why does the name on the box matter? Well, if you have spent any time looking at import machines online, you may have noticed that a lot of these machines look very, very similar and sometimes exactly the same, save for a different colored paint job and a different name on the nameplate. The way that it normally works is that most of these companies get the raw castings for their machines made in the same handful of foundries. The difference, however, is in the quality of the materials used to make those castings and the quality assurance of the raw castings themselves used to assemble the machines. Take Precision Matthews, for example. When Precision Matthews has castings made for their machines, there's gonna be a certain bar of quality that those castings have to meet before they can be used to assemble a Precision Matthews branded machine. As you can imagine, not every casting is gonna meet that bar. So what happens to those castings that fall short? Well, enter the random eBay machine tool company. They have to get their castings somewhere. And it's not just the castings that you wanna consider. Also think about every nut, bolt, 
lead and feed screw used to assemble the machine. All these things add up and contribute to the overall quality of the machine. And while on the subject of parts, it's definitely worth considering parts availability for repair and replacement, which of course goes hand in hand with things like customer service and warranty. Especially if this is gonna be one of your first machines, because trust me, you <laughs> are definitely gonna make some mistakes along the way. And having a reputable company with a solid customer service and a good warranty standing behind your machine is gonna go a long way when it comes to sort of giving you the room to make those mistakes while you figure things out without having an existential meltdown because you just broke your brand new machine. Okay, so I will very, very briefly go over size capacity or work envelope because I think for the most part, it's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, a smaller machine is gonna have a smaller capacity. It is what it is, right? But that being said, I don't think that I've ever really had any issues with the capacity of this machine. Nothing that's ever prevented me from doing what I wanna do. And in fact, I think there's really only one thing that I've ever really had to think about, and that's the Z height. So let's just quickly talk about that. So I've got the head raised up as high as it'll go now. And as you can see, there's a good deal of room here. From the base of the vise to the bottom of the spindle is just about dead on 16 inches. And if you're using a milling cutter, it's only gonna stick out, but another couple inches at the most. So that leaves you with a lot of room to work in. If however, I add a drill chuck and a drill, and a decent sized workpiece, you can see how this space does start to get eaten up. Like I said, however, this is really the only thing that I've ever even had to, I guess really even stop and think about. And even then, I have never found it to be an insurmountable obstacle that's prevented me from doing whatever it is that I was trying to do. So I guess maybe the main takeaway here is if you're planning on <laughs> resurfacing engine blocks or something like that, then maybe a mini mill isn't the right choice for you. Moving over to rigidity, we're going to start off over at the bridge port to set a little bit of a baseline, I guess. The bridge port style J-head milling machine is a very typical industrial sized machine and it comes in weighing somewhere right around two to two and a half thousand pounds. I'm telling you this because there's really just no way around the fact that that weight is going to be one of the biggest contributing factors when it comes to the rigidity of a machine. And while a mini mill is at a disadvantage due to its smaller size, there are some things that you can look for in the construction of the machine that have a significant impact on its overall rigidity. First, understand that a mini mill is a column mill, not a knee mill. This just means that the head of the machine moves up and down on a column, as opposed to a knee mill, like a bridge port, where the entire table moves up and down on a knee. This means that the construction and the shape of this column has a significant impact in the overall rigidity of the machine. This includes the way that the column actually attaches to the base of the machine. This machine here, for example, you can see is a square column machine and the column has this large foot or flange that's cast directly into the bottom of it. This flange then sits directly on top of the base and is bolted securely in place with four large bolts, two on either side, that pass directly through this two inch thick piece of solid cast iron. This is a good rigid design. Another important part of the construction to pay attention to is how the head of the machine actually attaches to the column. And there's really two parts to this. First, of course, on a column machine, you're gonna have the dovetail on the column. Just look for a nice, big, robust dovetail. The dovetail on this machine is just about four inches wide, which is almost the entire width of the column. Also, most of these column style machines have some sort of feature by which the head can rotate to either the left or the right. And because of that, you're gonna wanna take a good look at how the head actually attaches and tightens down down at that point of rotation. All right, you're looking up underneath the head now and the head of this machine rotates around this central point here. 
as you can see, there's this sort of really big thick flange section and then this extra thick protrusion of cast iron here. There are then three bolts around the diameter of sort of this rotation point that pass through that extra thick piece of cast iron and then tighten the head against the column of the machine. You will see some machines that only have a single bolt straight through the center. As you can imagine, something like that is gonna be far less rigid than a system like this. But while we're on the subject of just, I guess, sort of overall design and construction, I should at least briefly mention the round column pillar style mill drills or drill mills as I like to call them. Now, I'm not gonna talk trash on any specific type or brand of machine or anything like that, but I will say that in my opinion at least, if what you're after is primarily a milling machine like you want it to be a mill first and that's what you're after if that's the case in my opinion I would avoid the round column machines and instead look for a nice big robust square column with a stout dovetail power is another I think pretty straightforward topic obviously it'll have a typical electric motor so everything having to do with electric motors applies AC DC brushless etc Honestly, that could probably be its own little topic, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about electric motors here. Instead, I'll just quickly go over the two most common drive systems that you'll find attached to these machines. The first is, of course, belt drive, like I have here. This is just your typical belt and pulley system. This machine has two-step pulleys, which gives you two speed ranges to work with. And the common alternative to this is very, very similar, except instead of belts and pulleys, you'll have gears. So there will be a gear attached to the spindle and a gear attached to the motor. Often you will find that these gears are made of plastic, but I think some do come made out of metal. And I've never actually used that particular type of machine, but I have heard that the machines with the gear system do tend to be a bit louder than the machines with the pulley system. And it seems to be a pretty common modification to do on those machines where people will switch out that gear system for a belt and pulley system. One thing I can attest to is that the belt drive system on this machine really is just dead smooth and quiet. Now, as far as torque available at the spindle, this is really primarily gonna be determined by your motor. Like I said, see the exciting world of electric motors and torque curves for more information on that. As far as the different types of drive systems and how that's gonna affect torque, you're not really gonna see any difference at all there. This machine, for example, I would expect the motor to stall long before I'd see the belt slip. And as for my experience with this machine, I don't really have any reservations whatsoever throw in any type of material at this thing. I've cut aluminum, mild steel, stainless steel, annealed tool steel. I've never had any problems at all. Just keep in mind that the bigger the cutter, the slower you're gonna wanna run it. And the nature of electric motors is the slower you run them, the less torque you're gonna have available. Finally, we have come to features. And the reality is that just about all of these machines are gonna have a very similar set of features. Like we just talked about, there's gonna be an electric motor and some type of electronic speed control. The spindle is almost certainly gonna be either R8 or a Morse taper. The thing to consider here might be whether or not you already have an existing machine, like a mini lathe, for example. And if so, can you share tooling between the lathe and the milling machine? Maybe you have a mini lathe that has a Morse taper two in the tailstock. If so, it might be convenient to find a milling machine with a Morse taper two in the spindle so that you can share your existing tooling between the lathe and the mill. I guess the one feature that might be worth looking out for is a digital fine feed. Every single one of these machines should have some sort of fine feed on the spindle because remember, this is your tool height. You don't have a knee to adjust that, but the digital scale on this particular fine feed is just the absolute butter on the biscuit. This thing is so nice. It makes things just so smooth and so easy. Um, highly recommended. In my opinion, definitely worth looking out for a digital scale on the fine feed. And I think that pretty much covers it. I do really hope that this video has been helpful, but if you feel like there's anything that I got wrong or anything that I left out, 
please don't hesitate to put it in the comments down below. If you did find this video helpful and you want to support the channel, the easiest way to do that is to subscribe, like, and share. So, you know, click all the buttons. Thank you to my patrons. You inspire me with your generosity. And of course, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one very soon.